<laughs> All right, I think uh, I think we better um, kick it off uh, here. We're just past um, 5:30, and as long as everything is cool on the uh, Southampton end, uh, maybe you guys could give me a sign over there that I'm so I know everything's working okay. You're muted right now. Uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Well, welcome uh, everybody who is here uh, in York and also to everyone um, uh, online uh, and at Southampton. Uh, this is a bit of an experimental uh, endeavor. We have a camera over on one side of the room here. There's cameras over in Southampton. We're going to be broadcasting slides and so forth, so hopefully um, the technology uh, holds up. Um, my name is um, Sarah Perry. I'm a lecturer here at um, the University of York, and this is a, a slight departure from our regular um, York Heritage Research seminars in that we have a, a whole other site um, connected to us, and we're linked to that to the University of Southampton where they have their own um, lecture series which happens to, ha to take place on the same day um, around the same time that's uh, run by their archaeological computing um, research uh, group. And so what we have done is brought together a whole uh, range of folks uh, who are using um, data uh, and sharing data in interesting ways for um, different purposes, different audiences, uh, etc. And uh, we have a lineup of incredible speakers from all, all walks of the heritage uh, profession. So that the way that this seminar is going to uh, play out is we're having brief contributions from uh, each of them. We are kicking off here in uh, York with um, Dr. Holly uh, Wright, who's the European Projects Manager for the Archaeology uh, Data Service and really the inspiration, I guess, um, behind the session overall. So she's going to provide a bit of context um, for uh, what we're doing here uh, today and uh, where we're going. Uh, she will be followed then by um, Professor Julian uh, Richards, who is the director of the Archaeology Data, Data Service, also the director of the Center for Digital Heritage, and many other things, but I, don't, I gather we don't have time for me to list them all. Um, so, uh, a, an important um, person to know, and I think I might say um, a couple of words uh, after that, but then we'll pass it over um, to Southampton, where we have three speakers. Um, one is Hugh uh, Corley, who's the uh, archaeolo Archaeological Information Systems Manager uh, for English Heritage within the Intervention and Analysis Team. Uh, he's based at Fort Cumberland in uh, Portsmouth. So he's going to um, give us his um, professional perspective on the issue of uh, learning to share uh, your research data. And then we're followed, we'll, he will be followed by two um, um, up-and-coming uh, scholars working in web science at the University of Southampton and I think that um, Matt and Ellie who are running the stream and chairing the event from the Southampton and will um, give us a sense of the order that they'll be um, presenting in but um, we have both uh, Will Fison, who's a third-year web science PhD um, student uh, who's looking at um, researchers sharing their research outputs um, in uh, depth. And then we have uh, Chris uh, Fithian, I hope that I pronounced your name properly, um, who's also in his third year at Southampton, interested in social media and its value for um, charitable organizations. So without more uh, from me, I'm just going to pass it over to Southampton for them to say a hello, uh, and then we'll bring it back to Holly over here at York. So how's it going over there, guys? Oh, you need to unmute yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hi. Um, <laughs> hi to everyone in Southampton, and thanks for coming. And hi to everyone in York, and thanks, Sarah, for including us in the York Heritage Research Seminars. 
Um, and we hope we can, if this goes well, do more of the same. And yeah, without further ado, I think I'll let Sarah introduce Holly to start the presentation. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, switch it over uh, to Holly now. And, and we'll just do it for you. Yeah, there. exactly. Thanks so much, Holly. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, yes, my name is Holly Wright, and I work for the Archaeology Data Service here in York. Uh, but I must confess that uh, when I came up with the idea for this seminar, it was based on uh, something that happened to me while I was doing my PhD here at York. And my uh, PhD topic was archaeology, field drawing, and the semantic web. And for those of you who, and, and I started the PhD back in 2005. And for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with the semantic web, uh, this is actually before the term linked data had even been coined, so quite some time ago. So uh, like all good PhD students, I started out with my... Uh, Sorry, I just want to make sure your slides up here on screen. Oh, okay. Like all good PhD students, I started with my semantic web lit review. And I have this very, uh, I have this very uh, strong uh, memory of going and reading what, it, what certainly was at the time uh, very much the seminal article written by Tim Berners-Lee et al., uh, who invented the World Wide Web. And this was him in, back in 2001, so shortly after the term semantic web had even been coined, he uh, wrote this article, he wrote it for Scientific American, so it was meant to be uh, for a popular audience, um, very much setting out s sort of publicly what his vision was going to be for what the semantic web was going to look like. And the way that this article uh, begins is by constructing a scenario where uh, there are different, all of these different ways in which data was going to be shared. And it was talking about basically these two siblings and how they were going to go to uh, their their mother needed physical therapy and how they were going to coordinate this between them, making sure their mother saw the right doctors, uh, where their jobs were, how they could get to the hospital, when the appointments could be, all of this information that was just being uh, basically shared in ways that we really hadn't seen before. And I must confess, when I read this, my reaction was very much, I had this very strong, very visceral reaction, which was, I don't like this at all. <laughs> I, I felt like it felt invasive. I didn't feel comfortable with it. And, and to be honest, and I've never shared this with my PhD supervisor, but <laughs> I did sort of think to myself, what have I gotten myself into? I'm not sure how I feel about this. So, uh, so that was interesting. <laughs> um, Jump forward to 2011, and I am trying to get the PhD finished and submitted. And anybody who works with technology knows that if you uh, that things move very quickly. So of course, what did I have to do? I had to go back to the first chapter that I'd written for the PhD, reread everything, rewrite everything, and I actually returned to this article and I read this article again, and I had a completely different reaction to it. I remembered how strong my reaction was before, and my a uh, new reaction basically was, this is okay. And I don't think it was, and, and I can see the usefulness of being able to do something like this. And that usefulness outweighed my discomfort with what felt like this very invasive thing. And I thought, well, is this just my familiarity with the technology? Have I just become more, more comfortable with it? And I thought, no, that really isn't it. And what I realized was, at least for me, anecdotally, it was because of social media. Because we now have this mania for sharing and wanting to share was something that felt like this is the way it's always going to be from now on. And yes, we can be smarter about security. We can be more careful about what we share and when and why. But this is the way things are going to be. And anybody who... Uh, Anybody who is using social media knows that, especially in academia right now, there's a massive blurring between 
uh, the personal and the professional, and where do those two things end? So I started to think about, jump forward again, now that I work for the Archaeology Data Service, I started to think about, uh, so what does this mean in terms of sharing our research data? So uh, the ADS has been around 17 years, 18 years, 17 years, um, which means that uh, the staff have been spending a long time talking about why uh, you should archive and disseminate, uh, share your data. And the consensus opinion that the ADS is always fighting against is this idea of, well, why should I? And, uh, and Julian, and we get this sort of litany of excuses, which Julian will talk a little bit more about later. <laughs> but what I was really interested in was what is the emotion underlying these reasons? So, and it was really quite interesting talking to the, the ADS staff who had lots of years of experience about what they, what they thought those, ex, those emotional reasons were. So some people are just afraid to really, truly engage with their data. There's a fear there. Um, some people just, it's just project fatigue. It's something that happens at the end of the project invariably and people just are, they want to be done. Um, some people are really nervous about having to learn to work in a new way, adding something else to their workflow. Um, some people feel like because they weren't properly prepared, they're not comfortable with doing it. Uh, some people want to keep the funding uh, that is within their control doing something other than dealing with their data. And some people, despite however much uh, public funding they have received, still very much feel it's my data. So. But things have been changing in the last few years, and the attitude definitely has changed more into, well, why haven't you shared your data? So again, uh, Julian will talk more about this, but, um, but some things have changed. Um, the researchers who think it's my data are fewer. They, we are seeing uh, what people do think is a generational shift. Uh, researchers are seeing the impact benefit, although they're much more interested in the dissemination impact then I'm so glad that my data is going to be uh, carefully kept for me. Um, funders are now requiring archive and dissemination, uh, but there's not a lot of enforcement, and again, Julian will talk about that. Um, the open access movement is huge, and it's gaining momentum, and that's, a, that's definitely a big factor. And there is uh, generally an increased level of professionalism um, and a desire to follow best practice. So where does social media fit into all of this? Well, at least uh, talking to people at the ADS, uh, the role of social media so far, uh, we have absolutely no direct evidence that our use of social media, and we are very active, Twitter, Facebook, blogging, everything, has resulted in anyone choosing to deposit <laughs> their data for archiving or dissemination. <laughs> uh, we see it right now as something that we use for promotion. But we have to assume that anecdotally, uh, this promotion is going to start influencing people at some point. You have a colleague, and they have gotten a huge amount of support and attention because they've chosen to archive and disseminate their data. So maybe two years down the line, you think to yourself, oh, you know what, I'd like, quite like to have that too. I hope that that's what's going to be happening. Um, and there is a strong correlation between those who use social media and those who advocate for open access, as you would expect. And also, as you would expect, these are typically younger researchers. So uh, how is the next generation going to feel? That's what I'm really interested in. How are things changing with a generation of people who have been using social media for as long as they can really remember? Uh, that's going to be a very interesting development. So really, that was my, uh, the questions, those are the questions that I'm posing to the group, and I can't wait to hear what people's answers are. Um, and now I'll hand over to Julian to talk about sticks and carrots. <laughs> Thank you so much, Holly. I'm just, I'll just set up the slides. <laughs> Psychedelic. <laughs> Uh, we'll pass it over now to Julie, and I'll just double check that the slides look okay. If they, they're not, I might wander up again. To the okay, point. that's, so, that's um, fine. Next up is Professor Julian Richards. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, uh, Sarah, and, and thanks, Holly. Um, as you've gathered then from my uh, title, I'm rather set up here to take a, a slightly different view, which 
proves at least that I'm not a dictatorial director of ADS and we, <laughs> we, we, we allow multiple views within the organization. Um, so I'm, I'm going to play a bit of a devil's advocate and say sort of forget about all this sort of bottom-up social media stuff. What we really need is top-down sticks rather than uh, carrots because that's the only way that we can really get people to share their, their data. Um, so I'll mention some of the carrots first, or the, the, the ideas that are put forward for, by people as why we should share our data, particularly in archaeology, of course, there's the whole sort of professional ethics, the idea that when we excavate something, we destroy it, and therefore we should make our full archive available. And of course, usually that's just been a box in a museum, and it's only now that it's digital that we have to live up to that idea by making an archive that is really accessible that some of them can actually use. Uh, there's the carrot of one's academic reputation, that if you don't uh, publish your site, if you don't archive your, your site, then your, your reputation may be damaged, and conversely, you may gain QDOS by making your archive available. Uh, obviously, with the internet, there's the whole international aspect of it, the, the worldwide impact and exposure that one might get from sharing one's data that d did not apply in the old days where it was purely made available in an analog fashion. And there is, hopefully, one might, might think that you would look forward to getting feedback about your data set, that people might actually reuse it and come back to you and say, oh, I was really interested in your interpretation, but I've looked at your data and I think this, and that, et cetera, might lead to, to debate. And increasingly, there are, uh, there are more formal uh, ways of getting credit from uh, sharing your data. There's the whole development of proper methods of data citation, such as the as digital object identifiers, and there is the increasing trend towards formal publication citation for data sets as well. It's in data sets being developed by the journal Jode and by Internet Archaeology here in York. And maybe, maybe there is ref credit, although I'll believe it when I see it. The, 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 the sort of ref panels say that one should give credit for, for data sets rather than just for publications. But I've yet to see a university sort of ref committee that would have the confidence to put forward a data set rather than a, a, a publication as one of their, their outputs. So I'm, as you gather, a little bit cynical about, about some of these carrots. And I thought I would just go back briefly to some of the sort of the prehistory of this, which might explain why, because I'm a bit old in the tooth now, I'm a bit cynical uh, about this. And it's actually appropriately for a, a, a session that's been sort of streamed with Southampton, goes back to an article that Sebastian Ratz, then lecturer in computer science in Southampton, wrote in the, the Archaeological Computing Newsletter, volume at, at 16, and what you won't be able to see in Southampton is actually a picture of his father on the uh, on the wall of this lecture theatre. Where since we're in the, the Phillips Rats lecture theatre, so another nice uh, connection there. But um, Sebastian, as early as 1986, set up what he called the Archaeological Information Exchange, and this was and this is really very early days of the internet, obviously, and it was a combination of mailing lists and uh, shared software resources, but also the idea was that archaeologists should make their data sets available of, online. And uh, I've just sort of extracted from the article uh, there, key thing, that little use of the service by archaeologists as opposed to, to Unix addicts. And I think the service closed down, in effect, a few days, a few uh, a few months or years uh, maybe after that that article because it was never really uh, taken up but it was a, all respect to to Sebastian and those efforts it was a sort of pioneering attempt at setting up data sharing um, going forward fast forward a little bit but not by much to a similar initiative in the United States by uh, Harrison Nick Heitel the II who in 1994 set up an archaeological data archive project ADAP, uh, which you can read about in the CSE newsletter, which is a little online. And in 2002, in the same journal, he wrote a follow-up article saying the Archaeological Data Archive project ceases operation. Um, and in that article, he says, there appear to be two insurmountable problems with the archives. 
One is the absence of any real possibility for assembling a large enough body of material to be truly useful within a reasonable time. This reflects primarily the unwillingness of scholars to deposit materials in the archive. The second is the inability of the archaeological data archive to become self-sufficient within the next decade or so. Data depositors may be willing to pay for deposit and long-term preservation, but there has been no evidence of that for the near term. Archaeologists have, often, have too often treated their objects and their data as privately owned. Archaeology is hardly alone in finding it impossible to fund an archive for digital data. Archaeologists will, however, be taken to task more strongly than many scholars because their data cannot be re recreated once lost. So that was a sort of rather sad tale, really, from the United States. And I, I should hasten to add there has been a subsequent effort which is, has gained a bit more traction now, the, the digital antiquity in, in the US are doing the equivalent. Um, but I mean, that, that equivalent effort does come back to my sticks because they, and ADS, unlike the, the uh, data, ADAT, do have a few sticks. So uh, Holly's already mentioned some of the sort of common excuses that we get given in, in ADS. For, for the, one of the most common ones, oh, I'm, I'm not ready yet, I need to tidy up my, my data before I, I give it to you, which usually means that I worry that people think my data is crap, I think, really. <laughs> Um, um, I'll do it when, when my research is, is finished, slash published, or, although maybe they will never get round to publishing their, uh, their research. Um, I worry that people will steal my, my, my credit and, and uh, because I've not I've got the time to do it, uh, someone else will, will jump in there and, uh, and do it ahead of me. Um, it's too expensive. In other words, I forgot to budget for it. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we, we find that all, all the time. Uh, I haven't got permission that someone else owns the copyright or I've not negotiated with all the specialists or so forth, which again often comes down, I can't really be bothered or I've, I've not got the, the time. So lots of, lots of excuses, uh, and which, which is where the sticks come in. And I'm afraid I believe that far more than social media, it's the increasing uh, attitude to government, and this goes right back to to the the G8 charter and the uh, the EU Commission uh, in terms of open data that will have the greatest effect. The EPSRC has had the greatest impact on uh, universities in that they've taken one of the hardest lines, saying that published research papers should include a short statement describing how and on what terms any supporting data may be accessed. And they are requiring research organizations, universities, to ensure, therefore, that research data is securely preserved for a minimum of, of, of 10 years. And that has really galvanized, as everyone uh, in Southampton and York knows, universities into taking data repositories uh, seriously. Uh, the SRC and HRC uh, haven't yet taken quite such a strong line, and the HRC's uh, line in the case of archaeology, as I hope everyone knows, is that they expect an offer of their data to their of data to their data centres within three months of the end of the award, and in other cases, uh, HRC expects as access to be maintained uh, uh, for three years. Is that is just the requirement there? Although in the data centre, obviously they hope it will stay there longer. Um, but and this I think will apply with the EPSRC as well. Research councils are not really enforcing this, as far as we can see. And indeed, they don't have the staffing to enforce it. So this is the downside. They don't really have a means of following this up, I suspect. So it would be very interesting uh, to see whether there are any test cases where they decide to stop research funding for universities on the basis of this. But it is potentially a very powerful uh, stick, which is why universities are, are taking it, it seriously. But the reality, uh, 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 I like to, to remind people of a survey that David Roby, who was then head of the HRC ICT Methods Network, did on the sustainability of HRC funded digital resources. And he, this is in the sort of heyday of the AHDS, which some of you as will remember, when there were actually five data archives in the arts and humanities who were occupied full time in trying to get researchers to deposit their data. So there was massive resource being put into this, far more than there is now. And 
Uh, the HRC had also put a lot of money into resource enhancement projects, uh, creating digital resources online. Um, and of the surveys you can read there, are those completed by the end of 2005? Okay, 22 had been deposited, and I've not got the breakdown, but I've, actually quite a lot of those were in archaeology. Uh, we did much better than the other subject areas. But 12 claim with a deposit in process. I suspect none of them ever came to fruition. I also suspect that the 12 under negotiation never came to fruition. 16 were being chased. Nothing happened. Six did have a waiver, uh, and six said their output was not digital. So I suspect of, of the, um, the massive investment that was put into those resource enhancement projects, uh, very few of those data sets are now still available, other than those that are in, in repositories. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I think AHRC themselves pulled out of, of resource enhancement projects. So finally, um, this I've not put this slide in just because Hugh is going to speak next, I think, or is it down the line, but by contrast, I would applaud it English Heritage, who take a much firmer line and actually follow up. And this is the sort of guideline from their uh, National Heritage Protection Commission's program guidance, that it is a contractual requirement that archives should be deposited with ADS or with a similar digital archiving organization. But the difference here is that, that English Heritage do follow up. And if we take, for example, the Aggregates Levy Sustainability Fund, where a lot of work was funded, there they have told recalcitrant depositors that unless their data is deposited within ADS, they will not get any more English Heritage funding, which is a much more powerful argument and I believe is probably, at least for the near future, the only way that we can really do data sharing. Thank you, Julian. <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, switch us over then to um, Southampton uh, rather than have me uh, contribute at this point just to keep the move on since there was clearly a nice connection between um, Julian's uh, talk and I, what I imagine Hugh's going to say. So I will um, shift it over now uh, to you guys, uh, Matt. Oh, can you hear us? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, you can't hear our applause because uh, our microphone is muted, but there was plenty of applause, I'll just say that. Um, uh, yeah, we just hand straight over to you. Um, no. Um, yeah, it's an experience. So um, it, I'm pleased that Julian mentioned it HPP because actually I'm not even going to touch on it. Um, <laughs> partially because it's a large organization that I work for, and I don't really get an opportunity to work much. I'm, I'm aligned to HPP in a lot of ways, but the commission's leg of things is very it's different from what I work with. Um, but the, I think the key points from what Polly and um, Julian have said, by the way, I have no slides. You have to look at me and deal with that, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, the, um, but what I would say is the, um, the things that really come to my mind are um, uh, around the issues of data sharing. And one of the key things that keeps coming up, I think, is, um, is, is around the kind of data quality issues, actually. Um, and I think there's a variety of reasons as to why the data quality isn't always what one would be happy to share. And I think it's worth unpacking this a bit, um, particularly in the digital realm. And um, with my experience working with the um, interest system and trying to integrate that within our working patterns, one of the key issues we found is, is it's change and people don't do it very well. And it takes a long time for people to really become confident and comfortable with new digital systems. And um, and it's not just the people you think are going to provide the resistance that provide your resistance, because everyone does. Um, and I think the other thing is too is 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 you know in the in the government sector and particularly in the commercial realm, there really isn't a great deal of time, and um, you have ambitious projects that are attempting to try and do a great deal, and some of those projects, many of them increasingly, are digital. And trying to resource that and bring that into fruition is a real challenge, and I think um, comes out in people's um, reluctance to share. Um, and um, and I think too, there's a degree to which sometimes people become realistic about how much they can accomplish in the time that they have in the field. And um, I, I, I feel like I'm being overly negative, 
But um, I think that there's, um, you know, I think that increasingly people are becoming aware of the value of sharing, as well as the, the value of ensuring that data is of high enough quality to even be worth sharing. And, um, and there definitely are people who see the value of that as parallel to their, um, their, their publication records. But it is a challenge because, as has been pointed out, the, the, the carrots of, of depositing your data are not as, as strong as they need to be, perhaps, as, as, or the sticks, rather. Um, and, uh, the, um, but, I, but I do think that you know, the professional reputations and the expectations amongst, the, um, amongst professionals to increasingly do that is, is starting to change. And I think from the uh, government side of things, and perhaps even in the commercial sector, the, it, it, it's very likely that that will somewhat be driven by the by the you know the increased value within the REF and um, and the increased importance that it, it sees within the um, academic realm and I think that will carry forward into some into professional and, and within the government sector. So, it's a quick fly through. I can I can probably speak on a few more points or should I pass over to the next speaker, Ali? Okay. Uh, what I would, what I just want to point out too, though, is that um, the creating the tools sometimes for sharing data in the best possible way is really challenging. We can, um, we're, we're developing very slowly. It feels like sometimes treacle pace um, templates for um, taking our data from our interests database and uh, producing it as linked data. And um, while I think everyone appreciates the value of doing this the um, amount of resource and time required as well as expertise and knowledge is still, um, the threshold I feel is still very high. And um, th again it goes back to making sure that um, not only is your data in the right, the right quality but also that it's in the right shape because for it to work as linked data it has to have, it has to have certain characteristics, it has to have the certain qualities that people expect to find when they're looking at your data to share it. And um, I think that uh, these aren't always the same questions and the same um, structures that you're looking to create when you are capturing your data. And I know that we've recently spent a, a, a good few months now restructuring a portion of our database and our templates so that we can make it available as linked data. And um, it was as, as difficult for us to edit the database and the, the structure of our database so that we could implement the needed change to output as linked data as it has been to figure out how to map our data to um, the templates that, um, that Keith May and other people in, in Bloomberg and, and, and with Stellar and, and the Star Projects created. And, um, you know, this is, we have to a certain degree a great deal of luxury in being able to do this, and I think the the um, commercial sector is going to really struggle, in my opinion, at this point still, to, to create um, the type of data that will be semantically enabled and um, of, of maximum value so that we can start to see the real semantic, um, semantic uses and, and also what will come from that semantic use. even. The putting into leaked data form has shown us errors and problems with our data that we weren't aware of previously. So, in fact, the actual reuse, if you will, of creating it into linked data has even drawn out flaws and errors in our data sets. That it's great because we're seeing them instead of someone else, and we're able to correct those changes. But it is about identifying that you have to have the resource to do that and. In a competitive commercial environment, I think that's going to be a really difficult task, and it's 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 very um, it, it's going to be very challenging and interesting to see um, when people are able to show the benefits of semantic web. I think that's going to be the really critical element that will um, that will start to, to to push people over the you know in, in further into the investment needed for linked data to be. Um, Truly viable, and um, and I mean, I think that within our teams, it's taken a little bit of persuasion, but we are there. We understand the value of linked data, and we understand why we want to do it, and why we want to share data. And we definitely understand why we want to deposit it, and um, and also why we need to capture this digital data. Uh, 
so it's it's really about being able to start to see more and more of the actual practical benefits of linked data um, that will, I think, help with the further investment I think that's needed at the, if you will, the coal face now, because it is about getting the archaeologists in the field and the people designing the systems and working day to day with the systems and making the data digital that is really going to be critical for making that data worth sharing and useful as semantic data. Okay, now I'm going to move on to Chris. Um, I'm sure we'll have an entirely different perspective from outside the cultural, cultural heritage space. <coughs> this, this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, going on the earlier talk about there being carrots and sticks on this thing, mine is very much going to be about the carrots. Uh, it's going to seem quite nice <coughs> and one sided, uh, but it's all about personal marketing, uh, data sharing on social media, and how this can sort of build up a brand presence, um, a personal brand for yourself online. Um, and why you might want to do this. Uh, so I'm based in the Web Science Structural Training Center here at Southampton. Uh, a quick uh, overview of what web science is in a sentence. Uh, it's a new interdisciplinary approach to studying the web, uh, appreciating that the web is made up of more than just what you see in a browser, it's the technologies and the people that are involved in creating the content and using it. Um, so within that, uh, my own research is based around uh, charitable marketing and what value um, is created uh, through that on social media. Um, how uh, should success be measured in that sort of thing? So how do you tell if an organization is doing particularly well on social media and creating social capital and, and value on there for that organization? Um, and why people do things on social media? Is there any reason people are interacting with um, organizations in this way? So a more generalized interest uh, for me, it's just sort of how people use the web, um, how web and social media is disrupted, how it's changing things, and uh, sort of how you can bring about changes by doing things digitally and online. Um, and where this sort of goes into the topic for today is this sort of idea of personal marketing and how social media can be used to build up uh, your own personal brand uh, and sort of improve your outlook online. Um, so there's lots of online services that can uh, play a role in this, particularly social media. They are an ideal avenue um, to promote yourself online and get yourself out there. Um, things like Twitter allow you to broadcast your opinions on things, uh, really short, sharp messages, and get your views across there. Um, and if you build up a running commentary of your views, then you become associated with that sort of thing. Um, LinkedIn. Uh, in a sort of different way, allows you to build up almost an online CV. Um, so if you think about a traditional CV, where as a researcher you may put key publications, key conferences that you've been to, you now have this option where you're not confined to two pages of text or anything, you can actually link to your data sets, your findings, your papers, um, all sorts of rich digital content that builds up your personal profile and is there to advertise you um, and the stuff you've done. But the only way you can actually do that is if you put the stuff online in the first place to be able to link to um, and sort of associate it with you um, as all part of your brand. Then there are other networks that play a role in this. Uh, so academia.edu um, is one in particular. This sort of allows you to do a similar sort of thing, but connect to other researchers. You can find other people who are doing similar things, share papers that you've published. Um, share data if you want to, um, and build up this, this community of other people around you who are doing similar things. And so you're not only increasing your own brand, but the brand of the community of researchers doing that, that area of research. 
Um, so looking at LinkedIn a bit more, um, it's growing massively at the moment with uh, students and graduates. Uh, it's its fastest growing demographic. Um, and this is coming from this sort of value it creates for creating your, your online CV, your online brand. Um, and it is being picked up on by employers who can go on there, they can see all about you, they can see your research and history, um, the impact that you've created, and it shows immediately that you can be a team player, you're willing to share things, um, and that you have done all of these things. Okay. Uh, the alternative is if an employer or a, uh, a research partner or a, a funding body looks you up and finds nothing about you at all online. And the big question that arises there is, that, like, who is this person? Why, why are they completely invisible online? Um, so it sort of gives the impression that you're hiding something, and that's not really what you want. Um, but this shouldn't just sort of be a one-off thing that you do when you're looking to get something, uh, whether you're applying for funding or a job. Uh, it needs to be a sort of constant development. Um, that shows that you're committed to it, you're continuously doing it, and you're contributing to it regularly, building up this brand, not just a one-off sort of snapshot of yourself. Um, so there's been some recent changes uh, which sort of pushes social media towards this thing. Uh, last year there were a lot of guidelines published about uh, actually citing tweets um, and Facebook posts. So now uh, as more and more people are sharing their opinions on Twitter about these things, um, there's actually valuable uh, content being put on there uh, for an academic sense and you can now Properly cite these uh, messages um, in your academic work. And this year, this one's uh, getting a bit crazy, but there is now a, a Twitter journal. Um, they haven't actually published anything yet, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, if you can get your research into 140 characters, then well, <laughs> you deserve a medal. <laughs> um, but yeah, things like this are. are coming, they're starting to arise, um, and they're alternate ways of you sharing your research outputs, um, sharing your data, your findings, your views, um, and, and they're becoming more and more common. So at what point should social media actually enter into this uh, equation? So at the moment, um, as was said in one of the earlier talks, it's just sort of push at the end, once you've written it all up, you might write your paper, so give me like published here, um, which, yeah, okay, it's fine, you get some downloads on your paper, but should it enter earlier, um, should you share the results before you write up, get other people's opinions on those results, um, see what the community thinks about them, uh, should you share the data before you've got any results, before you've analysed it, um, so that people can say, okay, we've used your data, and we've found these things, we're looking at it in a different way. Um, or should you sort of use social media even before you start looking at anything and get a group of people together um, and look at it in, as a collaboration? Um, so these are some of the sort of carrots for using social media in, in this way. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about how it can be used in this sense, but uh, I probably won't be submitting a 140 character summary of my research. It's a bit, a bit too far. <laughs> okay, and last up, but not least, we have Will. Um, well, hi everyone, I'm uh, Will, um, and I'm also a uh, human science PhD so that's that's Chris, um, uh, and uh, my background is computer science, but um, my, um, I'm based in chemistry at the moment, so looking at sort of how the chemistry of all this sort of stuff. Um, so, um, after some time, I'll be Anyway, um, uh, what was that? So yeah, my research is looking at uh, how we can, um, so we have the web, um, it's a device, it's a sort of tool, this system that was originally designed for publishing, uh, for helping researchers communicate with one another in CERN, um, but ultimately um, it hasn't really enabled this sort of scholarly utopia that it perhaps could have done, and instead we're using it for all sorts of other things. Um, and really we're just sort of pushing PDFs around the web to each other, 
in the same way that it might have once dished uh, its paper to tell. Um, so I'm sort of trying to look at uh, academic machine from sort of uh, a uh, more holistic perspective, shall we say, um, where it's a sort of a bigger picture. Who are the stakeholders? Um, what sort of their what are their agendas? Um, and um, then I'll have a quick look at some sort of ideas and tools that I've been thinking about that may encourage a more open scholarly discourse. So, um, uh, so that, my sort of first uh, thoughts on the subject are that academic publishing uh, it performs a whole range of functions. It's not just about uh, providing access to research. It's about um, uh, it's about lots of other things, sort of like validating what we do for peer review. It's about rewarding researchers for uh, their, their endeavours, um, recognising people that have achieved. Um, sort of how do we measure impact? How do we measure? Uh, how do we determine uh, funding? All these sort of things. Um, so it's it's quite a, a complex um, sort of system that's developed over hundreds of years, and I think perhaps this is perhaps one failing of say open access as a as a movement to try and get uh, everything open, is that it only considers the access side of all these things. Um, it hasn't quite sort of worked out how things like impact and funding are all sort of fit within its model. Um, and perhaps that's why it hasn't been, uh, well, whilst it is set to this model, it's constantly made momentum, it hasn't sort of enabled this uh, um, sort of thing that was initially uh, planned. Um, the research is not just driven by their need to expand uh, the boundaries of knowledge, but then they're sort of driven by uh, like their egos, possibly. Um, so, uh, uh, looking at publishing, we realize there are lots of different stakeholders, so here's just a few of them. Um, so, we've got things like researchers, naturally, um, journal publishers, uh, universities. Um, and it seems to me that the key ones are actually quite, yeah, the researchers, um, uh, publishers, universities, and the uh, research councils that fund the research. Um, so, for example, as I said, like the researcher probably wants to uh, enhance their reputation, their career, and, uh, you know, and, and make a, a, an impact on their community, but also make some money while they're doing it, possibly, maybe not. Um, universities are just interested in sort of providing facilities for their um, uh, researchers, but, um, but also some sort of uh, impact. Um, and publishers, it can't be cynical, so they sort of uh, want to increase the profits of their shareholders or something. Um, so we've all, everyone's got their, their own role. Um, so uh, it seems to me that the key researcher, the key stakeholder is the researcher. They both produce and consume uh, research. Without it, without them, nothing can happen. Um, and they also do things like peer review and whatnot. So um, uh, if we're to make, uh, if we're to sort of instigate any changes for sort of the greater good of scholarly discourse, then it's the researchers that we need to target. Um, whether we should use carrots or sticks, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, uh, so, so we were, a lot of this have been discussed today, so what are the obstacles for sharing data? Um, so the three that I've picked out are that it's time and effort. Um, it, uh, researchers want to sort of go on maybe being in the lab or out on the field. Uh, they don't want to uh, sort of be messing around with things like uh, imprints or something. Um, uh, also, it's a lot of, uh, it, got things, the whole cost of having something more like papers because you know that you're going to get something from that. Um, so there's also uh, a number of risks. Um, so we've also already sort of encountered the idea that um, people might uh, get the credit for your work, uh, which is called presumption here. Um, and also, yeah, the fear that you don't want to stand up and um, uh, say, "Oh, this is what I've done," and then uh, others might sort of put it as well. Um, it's sort of uh, it's a risky business. And also, there's just a, a general lack of incentive. Uh, new approaches to um, disseminating the work aren't fully recognised yet, they're not held on the same level, uh, I suspect, <coughs> as their general publication or conference proceedings in some disciplines. Um, there's, there's a, there aren't really a sort of range of, of metrics that allow for uh, dissemination of this type to be held on the same plane. Um, they sort of like a possibly some sort of lower class uh, research uh, approach to research dissemination, which is something that needs to change. Um, so, uh, uh, a couple of ideas I've been thinking about are this idea of uh, reward and recognition is, is uh, a sort of key part for a researcher. And this is the idea that sort of perhaps a researcher, everyone has their own individual uh, portfolio of, of what they've uh, achieved. Um, and this could be sort of tailored to, uh, to sort of um, 
to the benefit of the different stakeholders that are interested in uh, any researcher. So if a researcher is trying to develop their reputation, then it follows that uh, they're trying to Im get impressed people, as it were. Um, and so uh, this is what, so this is a chemist, you can tell him he's going to test you. Um, uh, he's, um, and so he's probably likely to, object, he's likely to want to impress um, sort of industry, if they want, if they want to get a job. Uh, their community, if they want to sort of pass reputation, and also uh, the university if they want to see an impact. Um, and so uh, the idea is that the uh, sort of retail reward and recognition portfolio helps you to demonstrate all this um, by using say things like uh, provenance metadata to sort of uh, explain uh, how your work is uh, come to be, sort of to provide context um, and to sort of validate it. And we can use um, all sorts of metrics, sort of visualization, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and, and sort of uh, this, in theory, would become a sort of a part of the researcher's day-to-day -day, uh, life. Um, if the tool that allows you to disseminate uh, your research uh, operates, sort of, is something that you're using all the time, it's not, uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of streamlining your day-to-day -day work, then it very should become a, a hassle to uh, make your research more widely uh, disseminated. So, for example, if you want to if you're just collaborating with your supervisor or a couple of peers, and then you could use this uh, portfolio to make it uh, look your work available to them, uh, and then over time, sort of scale up information so that more and more people can see it. Um, that's sort of one idea, but I haven't, I haven't been built or anything else. Uh, but what has been built is this uh, redact tool, which I hope perhaps I mean, uh, it might be of interest to people here. It's this idea that one of the barriers to disseminating is a uh, like copyright and and um, whether or not you're, just, you know, you're not sure if you're allowed to disseminate this to a wider audience or not. So this is a little uh, tool that I've built that works in the browser, and it sort of takes your um, documents, presentations, and allows you to sort of um, extract uh, possibilities for copyright infringing images and find replacement ones from Flickr or Google using Creative Commons licenses. You can also sort of redact parts of text in a, in a document. So, for example, if you're perhaps working um, with industry collaborators and they don't want a certain part being made available, rather than us stopping you from publishing the whole document, it, uh, it will just take out uh, a certain section. And whilst um, I mean, uh, the idea is that this sort of helps to streamline that process and sort of does lots of expectations and things for you. Um, and yeah, I'd be interested in any feedback on that. And there is a uh, live version which I haven't put a link to, uh, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's just a quick overview of my research. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's the notion that you've got to focus on the research yeah, and to make it, uh, um, uh, I think, really sort of provide context to uh, new approaches to so that they are valued on the same level as, as conventional uh, approaches. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, guys. Do you see me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to move you on my end. All right, I think we're I think we've got it. So I don't have the feedback um, uh, from it. Thank you so much. As uh, we didn't have, um, there's a lot of people in the room. The the applause would have been deafening if everyone <laughs> uh, invested in them. Thank you so much um, uh, to everyone for your contributions, and we'll open it up to discussion. Um, period. I think probably starting one room and then the other uh, just to make it slightly easier. I think the one thing that I felt maybe was missing from the discussion uh, so far, uh, and it was brought up in t on Twitter as well, is the relationship between sharing data and actually doing um, new research, so using these tools as more than dissemination and communication um, tools and or reporting and documenting archiving um, tools. And uh, I think maybe my own experience, which I'll only mention very briefly given lack of time, uh, is uh, somebody who was kind of both both had the carrot and the stick sort of applied uh, in the sense that a lot of my own social media engagement began because I was forced into doing it by somebody else 
um, I was required to do it, for instance, with Twitter for a conference uh, a few years ago. And now, um, because I was forced into it, I was very reluctant, hated it uh, for the, that initial bit of time. But once I got the hang of it and then could push outside of the requirements that were you know, pressed down upon me and I could use it more organically and fluidly, it's become a kind of integral part of my own thinking and research process. So I use it um, both to analyze other people's um, work and to try to reframe my own research uh, initiatives. And I do think that one of the power powers of um, social media are their capacity to actually change the way that we intellectualize uh, and engage with research questions and different research communities. Um, so there's a real epistemological potential there that I think I just want to put out there um, for further consideration. And so I hope it's okay with you guys on the Southampton um, end, but I'm just going to ask if there are any questions um, in the room. Holly has a microphone and everything. <laughs> uh, for um, Holly or Julian or Hugh or Will or Chris, um, Anyone uh, have uh, comments, questions, perturbing issues that you want to bring up? I want to be attached to a host. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm going to speak tomorrow and so on, but my name is Jukka Jokilehto. I'm not an expert of this field at all, but I just wanted to give a little reflection. Uh, one of the problems that there has been in the Mediterranean region and the Middle East is that the archaeologists are very jealous about the material they discover and even the publications remain overdue. And then the problem is that Often it happens the archaeologist dies before he actually has been able to publish it and then nobody knows anything about his scribbles and manuscripts and it sort of remains forgotten. So there is an incredible amount of data which is being lost just because of this attitude, jealousy. Uh, in the 1970s, Ikram for example, um, published a um, sort of like a request to all archaeologists, professionals to please, when you do excavation, you should also include funding for the publication or at least the re producing the report in your budget from the start. The problem about sharing data I think it is like a secondary problem in, in the sense that I think that if we don't have data to share, I mean, you can have your Facebook and your Twitter and whatever you like, and it's no use. But, but I do understand that today we have digital media, and I think it is probably important to promote the use of these media for younger generation, but even for older generation, professionals who are in the field. Because once you start using them, you are beginning to get the data straight away from, the, from your work. So you don't have to sort of like work years and years to prepare it for publication. I think you should you should develop methods that make it make this data coming out systematically. There must be a link between planning the excavations and information management so that the the information is coming right through. For example, just to give an example that in in the Middle East most of the archaeological missions are European missions, European archaeologists who are doing them. And the local 
archaeologists are just like assisting. Um, in Iran, for example, in the in the until the even into the 20th century, uh, all the information that came from archaeological excavations went directly to Europe. And um, the but now when they have had this Islamic revolution in 19 in the 1980s, the government has decided already in the 1990s that any new archaeological mission from abroad can only be acceptable, first of all, that the if, if these people have been working before, they must have first published their previous results. And secondly, there must be a 50-50 collaboration with Iranian archaeologists and authorities so that we are really beginning to share the data. And I think that is, I think, one of the basic issues. But I, I mean, just as a matter of curiosity, I did my doctorate here in New York, and it was immediately photocopied to all the universities <laughs> in America uh, before digital age. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I must say that I have, in fact, uh, now when I, if I do research, I can go to the internet and I can find a lot of research uh, material from the internet. But when I did my research, I had to go to the archives and read the manuscripts. And that's also an interesting exercise. Mm -hmm. You should try. <laughs> Holly or Julian, did you have any comment to make in response to that? Um, I'll, I might turn it over to you guys then uh, to let me know if you've got some questions on uh, your end. We have a slight time crunch on our side in that we have to leave <laughs> uh, in the next 25 minutes. So, um, all right. Hi, guys. <laughs> any questions any of the speakers or any comments? In the side, who's going to kick us off? Please, we're not young. But if you've got a question, <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. If you, if you've got a question, you go. Um, I'm formulating. No, I'm fine. You don't hear me. But um, uh, I have a question for maybe for Holly and for Julian. Um, I was really interested in what Holly said about um whether this is a generational change, and it seems very much to be a, a cultural problem focused on the researchers particularly, and this idea that there's a correlation between people who are engaged in using social media and those who share their data and their, their publications. Um, and I was kind of, uh, how should I say this? I was wondering whether there's, um, an analogy between uh, the way people use the web and social media, where I think um, Chris mentioned the idea of people who lurk on social media and who are quite happy to share the views and resources on the web without contributing anything to themselves, whether that's the same in the dissemination and publication world, where there are lots of people who use the ADS. And we've heard, heard a lot about people who are depositing with the ADS and what motivates that. But Maybe we could hear a little bit about who are using these resources and whether the more these resources are used, the more researchers will see the benefit in sharing. So, hearing from maybe Jimmy or Holly about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm turning it over to you. Holly's just passed the microphone to Julian. Okay, I'll, I'll stand in front of the camera as well so that you can uh, see me, hopefully. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, just to uh, respond to the point about whether this is a generational uh, issue, uh, which was something that Holly put forward. I'd like to think it is, but I must admit I'm not convinced. Um, I did a seminar a little while ago 
with some graduate students in California, some of Ruth Tringham's students, who I expected to be really open to data sharing because Ruth has been pushing it there, as you might imagine. And it was actually the greatest resistance was from the PhD students in the States, who for understandable reasons, because they were relatively junior in their careers and had not published and there's all this sort of pressure on tenure in the in the in the states and getting publications out that they were very reluctant to make their data available because they felt vulnerable and they thought that more established academics would actually steal their work so the resistance there was actually coming from the younger generation rather than the older one but I'd obviously be interested in sort of reactions from the very young audience there in Southampton and here in York to, to get your sort of views uh, uh, about that. That's just my sort of perception. On the um, who uses the uh, the data, we are we're starting to build up quite a lot of, of case studies now, of really good case studies of, of where data sets have been reused. I have to say that from our access stats, as we now also publish for every archive. Uh, the, the sort of web usage, so you can go online to every archive and see the number of downloads and so forth. But um, the majority of, of use is actually of the text reports, it's fair to say, rather than the data sets. So things like grey literature are very extensively uh, used, although there I suspect that the usage is ironically probably not coming so much from the higher education sector, but it's actually coming from contract archaeology where it's actually helping them to do their their work more cost effectively. But having said that, uh, it's difficult, I think, to put a value on using a Grey Lit report, which might just save a contract at some rail fare or whatever in, in not having to go to the HER office, and the value that would come out from a PhD student or academic or an undergrad or master student downloading a data set and actually coming up with quite a, a, a new archaeological discovery. So even though downloads of data sets might be lower compared with Grey Lit Report's uh, usage, then it only takes one download of a data set and someone to come up with a completely different interpretation of a site. But I would think that was a, was really good value. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jude. Um, I guess kind of on that note, um, <laughs> I think it might, the point about generational usage of these media may, makes you think too, well, if you're talking about sticks and part of the stick is academic publishing systems and, and um, uh, research accounting frameworks, REFs and all of that stuff, um, if those systems change to allow the kind of sharing that we're talking about here, and um, potentially then you're changing some of that reluctance that might be there amongst different audiences. And um, what about the guys on Southampton and any other questions? I know everyone was, oh, sorry, questions from Twitter. Ah, okay, sorry, we have a question from Twitter, then we'll take that and then I'll pass it over. Okay, this is a, a question from Twitter. Um, see if I can find it now. Um, this is from Lorna Richardson. Do you think access to archaeological data actually contributes to public understanding of the past, or is this only interdiscipline issue? Oh. <laughs> Who wants to take control of that? Uh, <laughs> is that? Is that a response for Hugh <laughs> or others? <laughs> He was kind of able to answer that question for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I suppose I should come on camera. Um, I think I, one of the things, I'm going to sort of answer that question and maybe not, oh, I'm over here. No, no, it's um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, is that the, um, I, I think that, um, and I was in fact saying to some of the students here earlier, I think that in order for it to be a, um, a non-interdisciplinary thing, and in fact, even for it to be a disciplinary thing when it comes to data reuse, is that we need we need skills in it. We need people trained to do it. Um, and I I'm, I think that there is still a a certain degree of gap in that. And um, in my own experience, it's even difficult to. Um, in fact, it's a 
it's a change that we're in the midst of implementing. It's actually getting people to use the data in the field that they've just collected. So it, this idea of data reuse actually needs to start at the point in which we first capture it, and then we can start to understand the process of, of how we're going to do it better. Uh, I also think that so much of the knowledge of the quality of the data will come from that reuse of it. And, um, and so it's important that we, that we are able to do it interdisciplinary and that we're able to share that scale externally. But I, I'm afraid, I, from my perspective, I think we need to, to, walk, to walk before we can run, maybe. <laughs> Do you guys have other questions on your side? Yeah, uh, actually, go ahead. All right. Um, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> much, so, um, I don't know if these two things are, 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 are interconnected, but we saw, as part of the Web Science Research Week, um, which is taking place in Southampton this week, a really interesting lunchtime talk from people who are dealing with cybercrime. And one of the things that they were pointing out, which is, is, if not a strict inversion of this, um, a really interesting inversion of precisely the process that we're, um, that we're experiencing. So we're trying to encourage people who don't share, who don't engage with stuff that's online um, to do so. And they're dealing with um, what they describe as a, kind of a new breed of criminal, um, very vividly described as, as um, largely people between the age of 16 and, and 23 who they often um, discover when they finally break down the bedroom door, sitting there and their wife runs and their parents say they haven't come out of their bedroom in the past six months. Um, and they thought that they had the, you know, some kind of new online job where all this money was coming from and so on. Um, but of course it turns out that they've been selling credit cards or um, you know, in, in, in vast numbers. What was interesting about it was that they were saying that of course nobody, none of these, these teenagers on wake up one day saying, I, I want to become a, an online criminal mastermind. But in fact, there's a pathway, um, there's a kind of a progression where they start, um, and this is you know, one, something that they want to figure out, what, what is this process by which they first start going online and then go through a number of mental shifts where something that seemed uncomfortable to them before, say, logging onto a criminal website, um, say buying their first illegal credit card, um, say selling that on to somebody who gives them, them some money or whatever happens. There are all these various stages where they mentally um, rationalize and normalize this process um, you know, in ways that of course escalate and, 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 and sort of scale up. And we can see uh, you know, analogs to that in some ways, hopefully non-criminal ways, um, in the way that many of us engage with things like you know, with Facebook and so on. Many of us will have logged on, shared a little bit, felt a little bit uncomfortable, but then as we started kind of getting feedback from that process, started getting really you know, interested and excited, and then of course we share more and more and more. So the first thing is to say that I really fully agree with this, with, with this kind of let's take, see this as a step-by-step -step process. Now, it's not something where we can expect people who have conventionally hoarded things to suddenly overnight, you know, having some kind of Damascene conversion towards you know, putting it all online, and, and, and how do we make that happen. But that takes on to the second thing, and I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll stop this ramble very briefly, which is to say that when we talk about sticks and carrots, I fear that a lot of the sticks and carrots that we're talking, are, talking about are quite extrinsic to the process of putting stuff online. So you know, nobody puts their data on, like your professional ethics of course is something that we, we would hope that people would, make, would, would share stuff, but that's sort of somehow independent of of doing things digitally, um, whereas lots of things that we do do digitally have some kind of intrinsic worth, or at least the digital process speeds things up, gives us a very rapid feedback mechanism that, that makes us want to can keep doing that thing, whereas lots of the, the you know, whether and, and I, um, you know, I think the ADS is a great example of something that's incredibly worthwhile, but of course the feedback loop towards archiving and somebody coming back and saying, wow, I use your data set can be quite long. In fact, and of course, it may never happen. Um, or something like you know, Facebook, you put something on Facebook and 30 seconds later, people are responding to that already. So my, my open question to finish is, what ways can we, f can we speed up that process whereby we encourage people to do small things, but that they very, very rapidly derive some kind of immediate benefit? And that might be feedback, 
It might be mapping that thing out for them or connecting it to other content in ways that they simply couldn't do otherwise. You know, getting some kind of rapid say, feedback report rather than waiting six months for the specialist to tell me what these coins are or what that ceramic type is. You know, could we give them a um, you know, rapid assessment of archaeological stuff very quickly in ways that you couldn't do by printing a report, sending it around to you know, lots of people? I'll, I'll finish that, but um, that would be my question. Thank you. Did somebody um, a internet technology or an ABS one to respond because I think. Sorry. Could you guys <laughs> be on here? Or I'll mute. <laughs> All right. I don't hear myself in so many dimensions. Um, I guess what I mean, one of the things that strikes me about a forum like Internet Archaeology is that you do have, you know, you have an archival system, and then and then you're engaged with various social media that allow kind of instant feedback in some way. So I wonder if, to some extent, you're doing some work that kind of hints at what Leaf is mentioning there. But I don't want to put you on the spot. So that, <laughs> um, I guess the the related question is whether the ADS has. Um, some of those kind of instant uh, feedback mechanisms in in that you're already using, or that you're um, looking ahead towards, that possibly you can refer to. Uh, well, I can talk to okay, internet archaeology very, very briefly. <laughs> um, my use of Twitter has been sort of incidental, but I think where I find it most useful is actually just the uh, the conversations that I've been able to have, and maybe in the Finding of reviewers for content and finding finding uh, commentators for for stuff that's being um, uh, submitted and proposed to the journal. So that's where I've certainly found Twitter more uh, very useful. I don't really use Facebook. Anyone who's actually looked at Internacology's Facebook page can see that it's rarely updated. I just actually don't really get it. <laughs> so I need to do something about that. But certainly Twitter, I find really useful and valuable. And it's it's there's much more conversations. I think that have opened up for me through its use hmm. and maybe sort of the seeds of collaborative projects that have also um, sort of started on on Twitter. And, uh, and those are things I think that couldn't happen in my role or at least the role of an editor of, a, of another more, in quotes, traditional journal. Great, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I think Judith will agree, it was very much the sort of vision when we set internet archaeology up that it would become a sort of forum for quite rapid interaction and debate and commentaries on papers but over the years when we've experimented with that we've really found it difficult and I know you've tried to seed some debates but we've really found it difficult to to get people to comment on on papers online um, and I've, I've struggled with the reason for that because they they seem to be very happy to go on to uh, sort of uh, the Daily Mail website or local radio websites and make all sorts of, <laughs> of, of comments there, but to try and get people to make a sort of more structured academic comment, comment on a paper, we found hard. So again, yeah, the sort of social media and with, with, with ADS, I think we get quite a few comments going back on, on social media, on, particularly on, on Twitter when data sets are, are released or things that just come in by email to us, but of course that isn't then publicly shared. So I do agree with Leaf, it is a, it is a, a great problem, it's something we should work up to try and sort of improve that feedback loop. Thank you so much, Julian. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to be kicked out of the building in 10 minutes. Um, I'll draw the uh, seminar uh, to close. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who's joined us in person and online, but especially um, to Holly, who was the original kind of inspiration uh, for all of it, uh, to Julian, um, to Hugh, uh, Will, and Chris, and as well to Matt and Ellie uh, on the South Southampton side who organized uh, everything. Um, lots to think about and um, many opportunities, I think, for the future uh, in terms of making a difference, both in terms of uh, sharing data, but uh, in a kind of communication dissemination sense, but also utilizing that data to change the way um, we think and um, perform uh, and do research. So thank you so much, everyone.